Oh, um, I don't have the uh, co to conference title. Okay, like, I can read this. Or is this okay? Have his name so that people don't mess with him. Thirty minutes for questions. Um, if it goes off. Okay, good afternoon. Now uh, we start uh, afternoon session uh, with a <clears throat> mobile phone based fluorescent microscopy, sensing and, and, and diagnostics by uh, Zachary Bayer good, from University of uh, California. He, he will teach around one, one hour and uh, 30 minutes questions and comments. After that, we will have very interesting demonstration here with mobile phone, five prototypes we have here. Students will have the possibility to come to see here how it's working, to ask questions. Then you can ask, you can start. Great. Thank you. Hello, can everyone hear me? Okay, all right. Uh, my name is Zachary Ballard. I am a PhD student, I'm not a professor. So I'm like uh, many of you in the room. I'm still in the learning process, but um, I work in the lab of Idawan Uzjan, who is a professor at UCLA in the electrical engineering and bioengineering department. And he's asked for me today to come and speak on his behalf about some of the very exciting things we're doing in our lab, specifically to do with uh, fluorescent microscopy. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be here and speak uh, in front of you all, and I hope uh, you enjoy the talk. So this morning, uh, for those who attended the lecture this morning, uh, Professor Diaspro, uh, Diaspro talked about fluorescent microscopy uh, and the cutting edge of fluorescent microscopy, specifically super resolution. Um, systems such as STED and STORM and the uh, confocal microscope depicted here have given us invaluable information about how biological systems operate, uh, what they look like, um, and will continue um, into the future to give us incredible insight into the world around us. However, this is a $100,000, $200,000 US dollar piece of equipment. It is relegated to a laboratory, a well-funded laboratory, 
There's only a handful of STED microscopes in the world, partly because it's a new technique, but uh, the other part is that they're difficult to engineer, they're bulky, and they require very expensive optical components. Um, so in our lab, we think a lot about how can we take the principles of fluorescence microscopy and design systems that are compact, small, and cost effective. Something that might interface with your mobile phone. So before I talk about fluorescence microscopy and a couple of the devices I have up here, I would like first to give you an introduction to our lab and how we ended up uh, where we are with fluorescent mobile microscopy. So this is our lab. Uh, it's a very big lab. Uh, we have about uh, 20 core members uh, split between postdocs and PhD candidates like myself. Uh, we work with over 30 undergraduates um, at UCLA in California. Um, and at any given time, we have a dozen collaborations. Uh, we are in the electrical engineering department, but we have biochemists, we have biologists, we have computer scientists uh, working at UCLA and um, all over the world in collaboration with our uh, work. Um, our main research area is um, lens-free on-chip imaging, which I'll talk about briefly at the beginning of the talk, um, and then also smartphone-based uh, microscopes and point-of-care diagnostics, which will be the majority of the talk. These devices are fluorescent uh, micro, uh, microscopes. Um, and recently, we've been exploring areas of wearable sensing, as well as computational imaging and sensing using machine learning. So in our lab, we think about this graph a lot. Um, many of you are probably familiar with what this graph says, the story of, he, of this graph. But this is Moore's Law. Moore's Law states basically that the number of trans transistors you can fit on a given chip in a given area doubles about every year. Uh, we all see this, uh, we've all lived long enough to notice that mobile phones are becoming more powerful, are becoming faster, and are becoming smaller. The same sort of Moore's Law can be seen with the pixel count on your camera. And I say your camera because I guarantee most everybody in this room has a camera with them right now. <clears throat> every mobile phone made, every smartphone made, comes with a camera. It's basically a, a necessity at this point for consumer electronics. And Moore's Law can be seen in this piece of technology. I think the new iPhone has 16 megapixels, something like this, 16 million pixels. Uh, which, is, which is amazing. And this is a consumer device. You do not need to own a well-funded lab or be a part of a well-funded lab to own an iPhone. Um, so we think about how can we leverage this technology? How can we leverage the, the uh, low-cost nature of computation these days to enhance and enable new systems for microscopy? This slide tells a similar story. Um, that mobile phones are, are becoming almost as powerful as a desktop computer. We have mobile phones now that you can wear, or, or uh, computers you can wear on your wrists now with the Apple Watch, the Google Glass. Um, this technology is amazing. Uh, it's a trend that will continue um, into the foreseeable future. And we try to think about how to leverage this in our work. Um, not only is the technology amazing, the network is huge. 75% of the world is covered uh, in, in, with cell phone coverage. Uh, there's about one cell phone for every person on Earth. Um, and this technology can be found in developing countries. It is not only for um, you know, the United States, UK, Europe. Um, this technology is completely ubiquitous and everywhere. And with the network, it provides many different opportunities. You can take images and send them to a remote pathologist who can then make a diagnosis and send you back results. It is changing the way we do medicine and it's changing the way we do computation with the cloud, cloud connectivity, being able to actually process large amounts of data remotely and being sent the answer back to your phone.
So these are some examples of microscopes that we build in our lab. This is actually the very first prototype built in our lab about eight years ago. And it's uh, roughly the size of a, a quarter or a half dollar. Um, this uses lens-free on-chip imaging, which I'll talk about briefly at the beginning of the talk. And then we also have uh, tomographic microscopes for 3D imaging, as well as fluorescent microscopes, which will be the majority of the talk. We also have looked into sensing equipment for uh, detecting protein concentration, um, as well as heavy metal detectors. Um, this specific device up here is integrated with a mobile phone, and it can actually um, sense different levels of mercury in any given water sample. We took, we took this along the beaches of Southern California and measured the mercury contamination as we went from San Diego to Los Angeles. The idea is you could do this for every season and create spatial temporal maps that tell you how contamination is maybe spreading over time and over a given area. Um, here we have an E. coli sensor as well as an RDT reader for rapid diagnostic tests, which are used very heavily in clinics, as well as a device that actually counts Giardia cysts in a given water sample. So these are some examples of microscopes that we designed in our lab. We also have been working with Google Glass for hands-free applications, um, as well as wearable sensing. Um, a Fitbit is a wearable optical sensor. Uh, it measures your heart rate using LEDs. And we're trying to take that idea and that technology and push it forward uh, within fluorescent microscopy as well as other modalities. So before I talk about fluorescence microscopy, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, holography or on-chip imaging, lens-free on-chip imaging. This is actually the foundation of our lab. This is how we started. And the basic principle behind holography is to cre create partially coherent light, which can be created with incoherent light passed through an aperture. This partially coherent light can then create a diffraction pattern after interfering a reference beam and light scattered from a sample. We can then record this diffraction pattern at a detector or an image sensor, and then uh, computationally reconstruct what the image looks like at the object plane. This is a really interesting and exciting modality for microscopy because it's incredibly compact, it's incredibly low cost, only needing an image sensor. The illumination can be an LED, which is a matter of sense. And the most important thing is that the field of view for this type of modality is only limited by the size of the image sensor, which is amazing when you think about it. Most conventional benchtop optical microscopes, as they go to higher magnification and higher resolution, have a smaller field of view. That trade-off is not present in on-chip imaging. And we think about how to use this uh, to our advantage and use this uh, to help in the clinic in our work. This is an example of an image taken with a cell phone. Here are diffraction patterns. So these are holograms. Um, of red blood cells. And we can take such an image and by using a back propagation equation actually reconstruct what the image looks like or the object looks like at the object plane. So here is the reconstruction as compared to a 10x microscope objective. Again, this is just running through the framework. Here you have the scattered light from the object denoted in the black dotted line, interfering with the reference light denoted in the red dotted line. We can then take this hologram, which contains both amplitude and phase information, and back propagate the interfering waves to reconstruct a red blood cell. This is more images, more examples of holography in action. Uh, it's curious to look at the holograms on the left and note that they don't look like much. No one can look at this and tell me that it's a UCLA moniker until they pass it through the back, back propagation equation. Um, and this enables us to create very uh, compact systems. <clears throat> We've taken this work further by creating a pixel super resolution. Um, when we say pixel super resolution, we do not mean beating the diffraction limit like STED or STORM does. 
what we mean is taking an image sensor with a given pixel size and using computation to decrease that pixel size and increase the effective pixel count. We can do this by designing a system as depicted here, where we have a row of fibers that illuminate an object directly above an image sensor. We then capture different subsequent images of the same object that have sub-pixel shifted information. We can then combine this information to achieve a higher resolution hologram. So this is a kind of silly video, but it illustrates the point. If you take a number of sub-pixel shifted images, you notice this image is jittering around. You can then combine that information by using an optimization framework to actually achieve a higher resolution image. Another example of the improvements we get. So over here is a conventional inline hologram taken with a camera that has a 2.2 micron pixel size, five megapixels. So this is an older camera uh, on a phone, perhaps. Um, by using uh, the pixel super resolution technique, we can now actually resolve these fringes far away here that are nowhere to be seen in the uh, normal inline hologram. Um, this reduces the effect, effective pi pixel size to under 0.4 microns and increases our effective pixel count uh, to 180 megapixels. More examples of uh, pixel super resolution here. We've resolved a 338 or 300 nanometer grating using pixel super resolution. And obviously, um, this technique is uh, very valuable for imaging uh, biological samples as well. Um, and that's, that's what I want to come back to. Our lab is very applied. We're always thinking about addressing a need, a need that faces a specific region, a specific uh, part of the world, a need that can be addressed with appropriate technology. Um, this is an example of a blood smear. And we can actually use our inline holograms, our pixel super resolution techniques, to actually image malaria-infected cells and differentiate them from healthy red blood cells. This is one example of the work that we can do with holography. Another very exciting work, this was published in 2014, so a little while ago, was the imaging of uh, tissue samples. Now, this is a very challenging uh, field because tissue samples are very dense. They are not sparse objects. They're cells that are overlapping and combined and right next to each other. This is what a hologram looks like of a tissue sample. Uh, as you can see here, there's no very clean, airy disk pattern. There's no diffraction pattern that can be seen. It's just a mess. Uh, we can actually use pixel super resolution along with a multi-height phase retrieval algorithm to actually image very dense samples such as breast tissue, which is depicted over here. And again, this shows the power of on-chip imaging. Here, is the field of view of a 40x microscope objective, which can give you a very clean image, very high resolution image. It's uh, objectives a pathologist would use to actually diagnose cancer from a biopsy. However, the on-chip imaging field of view is only limited by the size of the image sensor, which for this case is the entire size of this image. This is incredibly useful for pathologists because now we can, in one image, imaging take, digitize an entire field of view and actually uh, provide that to a pathologist all at once, um, eliminating the need for a scanning microscope, eliminating the need for any sort of manual scanning, and opening the doors for computational analysis of tissue samples. We can add color. Uh, a lot of the work in the lab is uh, aimed at adding color uh, to images to match exactly that of uh, normal pathology stains. Um, here's another example of a pap smear and the color correction that we've um, performed with our uh, systems. And another way to improve these systems is uh, a method that we developed in our lab um, called, uh, we call these nano lenses. Nano lenses um, are actually a, energy, a minimal energy surface created by polyethylene glycol that condenses around uh, sub-diffraction limited particles. So what happens is we can use polyethylene glycol vapor, condense them around these 40 nanometer particles in some case. 
This effectively increases the scattering cross-section of the particle, and then we can resolve that the particle is there using super pixel resolution or our on-chip imaging. Um, this enables us to detect the presence of objects you would not be able to see with a benchtop microscope. And again, we can do this using a cost-effective and field-portable device um, depicted here that we've constructed and validated um, for measuring mm -hmm. Yeah, down to 48 nanometer particles. So I've talked briefly about on-chip imaging, lensless uh, on-chip holography, uh, but the main point of the talk today is on fluorescent microscopy. Um, but I wanted to start at the beginning with on-chip imaging to show you what we can do with that, but there's many things we can't do with that. And for the things that we can't do, we employ fluorescence. So I'm going to talk about two projects in our lab. They are not my work, so I will do the best to try to uh, teach you guys this work from other members of my lab and answer your questions at the end of the talk. The first uh, device I will talk about is a smartphone-based uh, Giardia analyzer. So this device actually counts Giardia cysts in a large volume of water sample. It is right here, and after, in the next session, you can come and actually look at this and look inside, and I can give a, a quick demo. This work was uh, made by Dr. Hachije Koidemir, who uh, was originally supposed to give this talk, but could not make it. And then the second device I will talk about is a smartphone-based fluorescence microscope for imaging, sizing, and sequencing DNA molecules. So the first device targets Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia is one of the most common waterborne pathogens worldwide. There's over 200 million cases a year of Giardia infections. It is a, uh, a cyst or an egg that can, uh, you can consume by eating fruit that is not well washed or by drinking water that has, is contaminated with Giardia. The Giardia cysts can then enter your gut and thrive and multiply. This can cause uh, stomach pains, diarrhea, um, and in some cases, death. And it's not only, it's, it's everywhere in the world. The United States, in fact, has Giardia uh, almost in every state in the rural area. So this is a problem that doesn't just affect uh, developing countries without access to potable water. Giardia is uh, absolutely found everywhere. Um, let's see, yeah, so this is an image of a fluorescently tagged Giardia uh, cyst. It's about five microns, so it's not under the diffraction limit, so you can't see it on a benchtop microscope, but what makes Giardia so hard to find is that it's typically in a water sample, which has many other particulates in it. So when you are imaging that under a microscope, you often can't differentiate the Giardia from something that might be dust or something that may not be harmful. Therefore, it is necessary to use fluorescence to tag Giardia such that you can differentiate it from other particulates in the water. Um, conventionally, Giardia can be uh, found in a water sample by, again, tagging it with a fluorophore. You can then take this water sample, you can filter it, you can maybe centrifuge it to concentrate the particulates down, you can then spread the water sample on a glass slide and use a conventional benchtop microscope and scan and count Giardia cysts in the water sample. This type of diagnosis is very time consuming. Uh, it also only can take a very low volume of water. You can imagine spreading a droplet over a surface. Um, imagine spreading 10 microliters or 10 milliliters of water over a surface and imaging uh, every uh, square millimeter of that sample. It would take you days. Um, so we are interested in developing a system that can take a large volume of water from a given river or lake or stream, and then we want to label Giardia, and then we want to detect it optically in a reasonable time frame, so under an hour. We want to be able to do this with a robust device that can be taken to the stream, to the lake, so that we can di uh, find Giardia samples at the point of care. So this is the Giardia 
microscope. It is a fluorescent microscope. Again, I will demo this uh, in the second session later this afternoon. Uh, it weighs about 200 grams. That's excluding the phone. Um, and it has a custom-developed app and algorithm for counting the Giardia cells and was made entirely in our lab using just a 3D printer and off-the-shelf off the shelf optical components. Um, so this is a little more in-depth of the design. So we excite the fluorophores that are tagged to Giardia just using blue LEDs. These are 470 nanometer LEDs. Um, they're very cheap. Um, we then shape the excitation light using uh, bandpass excitation filters, which are actually the most expensive part, uh, most expensive optical hardware in the system. These LEDs are uh, scattered, are encircle the sample and illuminate it evenly. Then the sample which is placed here in this cassette, the GRD is, uh, uh, fluoresces and then is captured uh, by a external lens, which is a demagnification lens in this case. And then the light passes through a long pass filter and then onto the image sensor embedded in the camera. This is just an illustration of the uh, 3D printing process. We get about uh, 100 micron resolution with our 3D printer, and that's the practical answer. The company will say higher resolution, but 100 microns is a huge uh, benefit to us. We can uh, print, uh, rapid prototype these devices every day in our lab for very low costs, um, and we can make very sophisticated and intricate uh, optomechanical parts with a 3D printer. This is just another slide illustrating the, um, the principles of the device. We have the LED, excitation filters, which was actually one excitation filter in time cut up with a glass cutter uh, placed in front of the LEDs. This is where the Giardia, the tag Giardia sits, fluorescing down into the image sensor. Uh, the phone we're using is a Nokia Lumia phone. It's a Windows phone. It has a pixel size of 1.12 microns, which is very standard nowadays um, in mobile phones. And it's actually a 40 megapixel camera. So it's an incredibly sophisticated camera and a relatively cheap phone. This is the cassette where we actually load the water sample with Giardia. Uh, the Giardia, again, is tagged with a fluorophore. It then is um, dropped into this cassette and here we have absorbent pads that absorb all the water. It can absorb 10 to 20 milliliters, depending on how many absorbent pads we have. Here we have a mesh filter. It's a 5 micron mesh filter. This does not allow GRD assist to pass through. Um, so the tag GRD assists remain on the surface, whereas uh, the uh, fluorescent molecules that have not been attached to the GRD will go into the absorbent pads along with the rest of the liquid. And then here we have an image taken with our fluorescent microscope. Uh, don't you think it's very pretty? No, nobody? No, I think it's very ugly looking, actually. Um, <laughs> it's, it doesn't look like much. And that's because we have a demagnification lens here. Um, we actually are demagnifying the, uh, the sample so that we can achieve a very large field of view. And again, I go back to this very large field of view. Um, it's incredibly important for um, measuring a large volume of water. If you were to take this cassette, which has been engineered, and put it onto a benchtop microscope using a 4x objective, which is kind of the standard smallest magnification, largest field of view uh, microscope objective in a benchtop microscope, you would have to take 26 images and stitch them together to count the number of GRD assists in that given water sample. Here we can take it in one snapshot uh, with the demagnification lens and cell phone. So now I'll talk a little bit about how the sample is prepared. Um, it's relatively simple. Uh, we have a sample of water. Um, we add a antibody conjugated with fluorophore. This antibody specifically targets the cell wall. As uh, Professor Diaspora said today, um, a lot of biologists just always assume that when you tag something, it works 100% of the time, and we are very guilty of that. Um, we do have a very sophisticated machine learning algorithm that actually does uh, help us differentiate tagged Giardia from things that 
are fluorescing, but aren't Giardia, and I will talk about that later. Uh, but for the purposes of this work, we assume that the antibodies do their work and attach only to the Giardia cysts. Um, we then, after we add the antibody, the flu uh, fluorescent conjugated antibody into the water sample, we cover it to prevent photobleaching from ambient light, and we allow it to sit for 30 to 40 minutes. This is an example of the workflow here, collecting the sample, adding the uh, fluorescent tag, waiting, then we inject the uh, fluorescently tagged Giardia water sample into the cassette, load the cassette, and image. We also do add a counter stain to um, increase our signal to noise, as well as a solution which prevents fading of the fluorophore. So here's an example, again, of an image taken with the phone. Um, it's maybe hard to see what's going on in this large image, so we have these zoomed in versions here. This is taken on the phone. This is a benchtop comparison. So you can see here that we're sacrificing quite a bit of resolution. We really can't make out any features of the GRD assist um, in this sample. Um, but we, again, we're, we leverage computation to try to count the GRD assists with the given low resolution. But the important point here is that they're differentiable um, from each other uh, using our camera phone. Another microscope comparison showing the GRD assists. So now I'll talk about the software and the computation. Again, this is needed. This is very necessary for getting this device to work. Um, it would obviously be ridiculous to hire somebody, maybe an undergraduate, to sit and count all the GRD assists in a given image. There can be hundreds, thousands. So we've developed an app that we've loaded onto the mobile phone, which does this counting of the GRD assists for us. So the workflow for the software uh, is like this. We open up the application. We take an image. We then upload this image to our servers, which are based in our lab. The servers then take the uh, raw image, convert it to TIFF, crop it, and then uh, they run the machine learning algorithm, which we'll, I will talk about in one minute, um, and then calculates the total GRD account and then sends it back to the mobile phone. It also tags the GPS location as well as the time and the date. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with machine learning, but it's a very hot topic right now. Um, it's kind of the combination of lots of fields that have been around for a long time. Um, but the idea of machine learning is that you have an algorithm that performs a task. For instance, our task here is counting Giardia cells and differentiating them from things that might not be Giardia, like dust. But in order for the machine learning algorithm to work, it has to learn. So it learns on data previously taken with the system. So for this work, we actually have images of 30,000 fluorescently tagged cysts taken with our microscope, as well as 100,000 dust particles. Uh, we've labeled these using a gold standard optical benchtop microscope um, so that we know exactly what we're looking at. And then we've uh, taken this training data and extracted features from each cyst. When I say a feature, I mean uh, maximum brightness, maybe the width of the cyst, the length of the cyst, the ratio between the width and the length of the cyst. Uh, we have 71 of these features that we then uh, input into our uh, machine learning algorithm, and then the machine learning algorithm will uh, actually output a count. Uh, we did a survey of different algorithms, found that this bagged trees algorithm, which is a bootstrap algor uh, aggregator algorithm, uh, we can talk more in the uh, demo session about the specifics of the algorithm, but we actually are able to, with those 71 features and that training data, get a very high sensitivity of our device, uh, with 95% uh, success rate of differentiating Giardia particles from other things that are fluorescing but are maybe not Giardia. The total limit of detection of the system is 12 cysts per milliliter. We obviously would like this to be uh, one cyst per milliliter. Uh, but the high cis per mil count in the limit of detection, the higher cis per mil count, comes from the fact that we don't have 100% uh, 
uh, tagging rate of the, the fluorophore on the giardia, and perhaps some of the giardia goes through the filter. Uh, but nevertheless, 12 cis per mil is a very satisfactory result for a portable device and is actually um, um, being used right now by the uh, field tested by the US military for assessing uh, remote water sources. Um, this is an example of uh, analysis results coming from our machine learning algorithm. Here we have a very high density cis count and a low density cis count. The algorithm is robust and does work with both types of scenarios. So taken together, we've created a system that is uh, portable. Um, I held it up a second ago. It's uh, very small. I brought it in my suitcase and didn't worry too much about it. Um, 200 grams. It can take 10 to 20 milliliters of water, which is a large volume. It can do a cyst count in under an hour. Uh, that's with the labeling step included. Um, and yeah, so we have a, here is the 67% recovery efficiency, which leads to a limit of detection of 12 cysts per milliliter. So now for the second part of the talk, I'm going to focus on a smartphone-based fluorescence microscope uh, for DNA imaging, sizing, and sequencing. This work was pioneered by Dr. Qingshan Wei, who's actually left our lab just a couple months ago and is now a professor at uh, bioengineering department at uh, North Carolina State University, so we're all very proud of him and I wish he uh, has a lot of success in his, his work. Now, I talked about Giardia and why we need to use fluorescence to see Giardia. We need to tag it with a fluorophore to differentiate it from other particles that might be in water. DNA is a very different story. Um, you can actually extract DNA using a centrifuge and common laboratory techniques into a very pure form. So we don't necessarily need to know that it's DNA. But it's an incredibly weak scatterer. You cannot see it necessarily with an optical microscope because its dimensions are far below the diffraction limit in its width. The length can be many microns, dozens of microns, but the width is far too small to see it strongly in an optical microscope. So many researchers have uh, poured a lot of time into uh, tagging uh, DNA and have gotten very good at even tagging specific sequences in a DNA genome, which is obviously very valuable for studying genetics and studying uh, DNA replication and mutation. Um, these types of measurements can be done on a conventional fluorescent microscope, confocal microscope, STED. Um, but there's a lot of need to do these types of, uh, do this type of imaging with a field portable and low cost system. Um, the implications are, are, are rather wide-reaching. This is another um, instrument used uh, for sensing DNA, uh, distinguishing different sequences based on their length, uh, which is relatively low cost. Um, however, it has problems with uh, sequences or, or strands with that have a very low number of kilobase pairs. So a lot of the motivation behind this project has to do with studying DNA replication and studying mutations. So I'm not sure how many of you have heard of copy number variation, but this is a phenomenon uh, in DNA where when it replicates, it accidentally duplicates a specific part of the genome. Uh, this is a mutation, and it has been associated with uh, cancers, neurological diseases, Alzheimer's, autism, schizophrenia. There's a, a long list. and so. If we had a robust and low-cost way of actually sizing a DNA sequence, we could have a really good understanding of if copy number variation is going on in a given sample. This would be very valuable for diagnostics and for understanding the effect, effectiveness of different medicines and also um, learning more about DNA and the replication process. So here we have created another fluorescent microscope this microscope is specifically designed for imaging DNA, whereas the other fluorescent microscope for GR, uh, was specifically designed for counting Giardia cysts. They are both fluorescent microscopes, but because of the application, they take on very different forms. Um, let's see if I have. So 
the fluorescent microscope for DNA analysis is here. Um, it's more or less the same size as the Giardia analyzer. Um, and using very simple sample preparation techniques, we can actually stretch the DNA and then size the length, uh, take, do a sizing measurement where we essentially measure the length of the DNA. Here we have uh, comparisons of a cell phone image taken with our mobile microscope and then a bench top image. We have a very wide field of view, two millimeters squared. Again, this is our field of view. This is a comparison to a 100x objective on an optical bench top microscope. So the design of the microscope is as follows. We actually employ a laser diode here. We need uh, to excite the fluorophores at a very high rate. We need them to be very bright. So we have a very high power laser diode. This isn't a laser in the traditional form. It's actually relatively cheap compared to a you know, pulsed laser or something like this. Um, it is the most expensive part of this system. Uh, comes in at about $100. $50, they are becoming uh, very cheap now, especially if you move to lower powers. We have a laser diode, it's incident upon our sample at a very high angle, 75 degrees. This is necessary for getting a very pure dark field and reducing the background. We then have a cover slip with the DNA that's loaded through a sliding uh, chamber, and then an external lens, and then a emission filter. We don't employ an excitation filter here, because the bandwidth of the laser diode is uh, adequate enough for reducing background. Um, and we have a focusing knob on top here. So the sample preparation process. I think this is the coolest part of this work um, because it's, it's amazing the results you can get with something so simple. Uh, we take a cover slip. Um, this is an established technique, by the way. It's not necessarily pioneered by our lab, but it is utilized to our lab uh, with great effect. Uh, you, you have a cover slip, and you uh, silenize the cover slip. So you have a monolayer of amine groups on top. This can be done through vapor deposition very easily. Uh, there's other methods of doing this as well. It's a very common uh, step in wet labs uh, for surface functionalization. We then take our silenized cover slip and drop our fluorescently tagged DNA, three microliters, using a pipette. We then take a second cover slip and put it on top of the droplet and quickly push down with our fingertip. This creates shear forces at the boundary of the silenized cover slip and the DNA, and it actually stretches the DNA, and they align outward from where the droplet was. Um, this is a comparison of doing the compression technique correctly, whereas if you're a little too slow and not exactly enough finesse, uh, they can, the DNA can look like a bunch of jumbled yarn or something like this. Um, so this is a technique that requires um, some training, but is very simple to implement and very low cost, not needing any sort of expensive uh, pieces of equipment. And here we have an example or an image of our mobile phone. This has been... Uh, color mapped, obviously. Um, and then here, 77 stitched frames from an optical microscope. So again, it's coming back to this idea of field of view. Um, especially for studying copy number variation, it's very important to gather large statistics. The only way to gather large statistics with a small field of view would be to mechanically scan or have someone manually scan. But by using a demagnification, lower magnification, sacrificing some resolution, um, with uh, a very high quality image sensor, we can achieve uh, a very large field of view for gathering large statistics about the DNA sizes. So once we have images, this is um, how we process them. We actually um, average um, about anywhere from five to 10 different images. Um, signal to noise improves as the square root of n as you average uh, images. Um, so there's diminishing returns. Um, however, you can get a large improvement in your SNR by averaging. So we found the sweet spot to be around 10 images. So we can take 10 images. They're at a four second exposure time. 
And then we combine them and average them to create a high SNR raw image. And we add a mask to that image. And then we actually do a rough estimate of the length, uh, measuring the skeleton of the DNA. And then we actually also use the PSF of the imaging system in combination with this rough estimation to get an idea accurately of the size. We estimated the PSF of the imaging system using 100 nanometer fluorescent beads, and then actually created a sliding PSF window here and developed an algorithm that detects the minimum distance between the skeleton length and the sliding PSF window here to actually accurately size the DNA. So comparing our sizing measurements with that done on a conventional benchtop microscope, um, we achieve a very close match. So uh, we're off by, we have a bias, a negative bias of 0.33 microns um, with a standard deviation of one micron. The standard deviation is not necessarily a factor of our measurement technique, but could be a factor of uh, vari uh, variations within the uh, length of the DNA sequences measured. We also validated uh, this measurement technique for different sizes of DNA strands. Here we have five kilobase pairs, 10 kilobase pairs, 20, 40, and 48, um, with their size distributions uh, denoted below. So uh, we have a negative bias uh, for the higher, uh, for the longer DNA, and actually a positive bias um, for the lower DNA, which is um, not s still sufficient for uh, measuring and counting base pairs uh, or kilobase pairs. So this is a comparison, direct comparison of the cell phone versus the 100x objective. This is the length measurement. So the y equals x line would denote the uh, gold standard or exactly how the DNA, how long the DNA should be. So here you see that positive bias for the very small uh, length DNA. And then up here you get slightly negative bias. But all in all, the um, mobile phone-based microscope and the benchtop uh, system agree very closely with each other in terms of measuring the length of DNA. So it's great. We can measure the length of DNA. It's, it's, it's very, we can do it in a field portable system. Um, but we don't get any information about what actually that genome is. What is that sequence that is maybe copied? So one way, again, to do this is to leverage fluorescence. Here we have an image of, I don't know if maybe the screen is a bit dark, um, but here there's different colors of fluorophores conjugated to different sequences. And here they found that this strain of DNA varies from this one by one uh, fluorophore or one sequence. That there is their copy number variation, and they also know exactly what sequence was copied incorrectly. This is really important for understanding uh, the genomics behind cancer, um, et cetera. So we're trying to take this work now um, to do similar types of things. So uh, in this work, we used the KRAS gene, which uh, produces a protein, which is vital for tissue signaling. That's how tissues uh, respond to their environment and grow. Um, the mutation of this KRAS gene is um, fundamental for cancer growth uh, and cancer spreading in tissues. So it's a very important gene to study for uh, replication and mutation. So to implement this type of tag genomic sequence uh, imaging using fluorescence, we had to develop a dual color fluorescence microscope. Here we are employing two different LEDs um, that sit again at a very high angle to avoid to have a very pure dark field. We're using a 532 nanometer laser diode and a 638 nanometer laser diode that can be turned on sequentially and controlled. We also have included a white LED, very cheap off the shelf, uh, just for, to be able to do bright field imaging for alignment purposes, et cetera. 
And this work is done in collaboration with Uppsala University in Sweden. And they're very good biochemists. And what they were able to do was <coughs> immobilize this CRAS, K-R-A-S -K genome onto a glass slide and implement uh, rolling cir circle amplification, which is a way for DNA to multiply seemingly endlessly the same sequence over and over again. Um, when it's doing this replication, it is prone to mutations. And if we can uh, tag those mutations with a fluorophore, we can then get the ratio of successfully replicated genomic sequences to uh, mutated sequences. So that's where the dual color comes in. We need both uh, laser diodes exciting different fluorophores at different wavelengths, spectrally separated, so that we can get an idea of the ratio of uh, successful replications to mutations. What's very exciting about this work is the possibility of doing this um, in situ or even in vivo. Um, what I mean by that is working with actual cells, actual biopsies taken from patients. Um, the dream here is to combine morphological information about the tissue and the cells with molecular information about the genomic sequences in those cells. So here is an example of a tissue uh, fluorescing. The blue is from the background, but the green dots are the mutated genomic sequences, which the researchers uh, in collaboration with us have been able to successfully tag uh, the mutant label only. So only the green dots indicate the mutant label, and the successful replications are actually not uh, ligated and tagged. This can, get you, this can give an idea of if tissue is cancerous and can be the future of cancer diagnostics pathology and understanding uh, how cancers spread. Here's another example of combining tissue morphology with molecular information. Here is a, uh, uh, some, tissue, some cancerous cells tagged, this is the bright field image along with the fluorescent image, tagged on their successful replications of the KRAS sequence and the uh, mutated sequence done, performed on our mobile phone. We're very excited about this work. It's been recently published um, in Nature Communications and we're, uh, the collaboration is ongoing and um, we're very excited for the, for the future of this. So in conclusion, I've showed two examples of fluorescent microscopes developed in our lab. These are microscopes designed for a very specific purpose. They have, uh, are created entirely with a 3D printer and off-the-shelf optical components. The Giardia device is around uh, $250 combined total. The DNA analyzer is about $400 when you take into account the laser diode. Um, these costs do exclude the phone. If you were producing this on a large scale, obviously these costs could go down, but they're a fraction of uh, the cost of a fluorescent microscope, a confocal microscope, or other type of uh, standard laboratory equipment. And we hope that these devices can have impact in low resource areas outside of the context of a well-funded lab. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, everybody in my group and all of our funding sources um, with that, it concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, after this You will have many questions, and we have time for that. Yeah, I think I went way under. Huh. Okay. Question, please. Yes. Let's start from here. Thank you for your nice presentation. I'd like to uh, uh, know uh, more about the uh, uh, imaging process. Could you please uh, explain again? For which device, or do you mean the holog uh, uh, holography? Holographic uh, imaging.
Right, so this is, um, again, out of the context of fluorescent microscopy, this is holographic imaging. Uh, hologram is, is kind of a misnomer, uh, because when we think hologram, we think of Star Wars, we think of uh, a 3D projection of something. Um, when we say hologram in the lab, what we mean is a diffraction pattern. We mean two interfering waves. So we can record a hologram from an object by sending partially coherent light. You can obviously do this with completely coherent light, but we use partially coherent light for reasons I'll get to in one minute. Partially coherent light interacts with the object. This object then scatters the light. And at the image uh, sensor, we then record the interference of the scattered light and the reference light, the background light. This interference pattern looks like the airy disk. So that's why um, in the images with the cells, maybe this is better here. So here is here are the fringes of the diffraction pattern. This is the interference we're observing. So this, this contains both amplitude and phase information. Um, and then we can pass this image through this back propagation algorithm, and it actually can take into account the spatial frequencies and reconstruct the image at the object plane. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Did you have any other follow-ups? We use partially coherent light um, because it can be, we can achieve that with off-the-shelf LEDs. Um, to achieve strong coherence, you need a laser source. Um, so there's a lot of holography done with lasers um, to great effect. However, there's some problems. One of the problems is speckle, which is basically noise created by many different interferences uh, in your system. So by using partially coherent illumination, we actually can, can uh, resolve holograms with less speckle and therefore less noise. Yes. Thank you for the nice presentation about the applications and the very nice devices. I had particularly two questions. Uh, first one is about uh, that uh, the calibrations and the validation tests that you've been performing. I mean, uh, uh, many times using big, lac big, big laboratory equipment and stuff, uh, sometimes the percentage of the validation does not fall into above 90%. But it was very interesting for me that how uh, with using a very wide field of view and a very, very low resolution, the very high percentage of validations could be occurred. I wanted to uh, know a bit, a bit more details about the validation tests that have been done. And secondly, I wanted to see that if the validation tests uh, give the, uh, of, this, of the all devices give these very nice results, um, is there any efforts by your group to put it into the medical applications through the insurances and the medical systems of the U.S. or any other part in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so let me, let me discuss briefly more about the validation of the Giardia device, and then I'll talk about the DNA device. So the validation of the Giardia device was done actually with a flow cytometer. So we spiked water samples. Um, we spiked not only water samples from the lab, we spiked water samples from the tap water, water samples from the ocean, and water samples from a local reservoir. We then validated our limit of detection against these different water sources with spiked Giardia. There's no way of knowing you know, if those sources have Giardia. Hopefully our tap water would not. Um, so we, we rigorously validated that to, to show and demonstrate that this device would indeed work if you took it to a stream and measured a water sample there. If that water sample may have, it may have a you know, very high concentration of dirt or something that could mess with the uh, uh, measurement. That's why in our, our training algorithm that I discussed, we have over 100,000 dust samples. That's actually a really important part of our machine learning algorithm and the algorithm that differentiates the Giardia. We have to know what objects fluoresce automatically or maybe capture the fluorophores that we would like to tag the Giardia with to actually accurately count the Giardia. So this is a really vital part of this work to getting this device to work in the field, not in a laboratory alone with very nice filtered water. So. Um, I hope that answers your question about the Giardia device. Um, again, the validation was done with a, a flow cytometer, which is the best, most gold standard way of doing it. 
so one uh, Giardia cyst at a time is passed through and counted. Um, and we spike them ourselves so we know, we know the concentration. Um, and then for the DNA, um, our validation was done with a 100x um, microscope objective, which is, as you can see, oh, there's Star Wars in the background. As you can see um, from these images, 100x is uh, high enough resolution to actually see the strands all the way and get a very accurate size of the length. So this is a valid gold standard for us to compare our, our microscope images to a benchtop microscope. Um, and here you can see the size distributions and then the corresponding lengths. And this is really all, this is the whole story of, of the validation um, right here. So this is how well our device performs against uh, the conventional uh, gold standard techniques. Whether that is good enough for studying certain copy number variation mutations, I am not the expert in that. Um, but it certainly is uh, under one kilobase pair accuracy, um, which is excellent. You know, if when you are ordering DNA, they differentiate them also oftentimes by the number of kilobase pairs. So we have under one kilobase pair accuracy. Um, but again, I can't speak to if that how useful that is for specific types studying specific types of mutations. And then the second part of your question was about... Was about if, the, if there is any plan in your group to yes. apply that into the medical system. Absolutely. So we're always open to collaborations with groups who can field test our devices. Um, like I said, we're working with the US military now to field test this Giardia device. Um, Professor Idawan Uzjan, uh, who leads the lab, actually does own a company that commercializes some of the devices from our lab. The most successful commercialization actually has been for reading rapid diagnostic tests, which are very prevalent in clinics. These are paper-based tests that immobilize certain biomarkers and change color, essentially based off of the presence of a biomarker, like a pregnancy test. So that's one device that has been commercialized. Um, and yeah, we're, we're very interested in collaborating with institutions and other groups to validate these, to push it towards commercialization, absolutely. But our lab is not a business. Uh, we, we focus on publishing papers. And so all the commercialization efforts happen outside the lab from existing members or from third parties that uh, see use in this technology. Thank you. Uh, nice work, uh, basically, you know, just uh, uh, replacing this uh, big equipment in, into a small system. That's really a great move. So, but I have a question. Perhaps you have just uh, he heard this question many times. So in this setup, you are just using your uh, mobile phone. Just sensor is being used, right, for imaging. So whereas uh, the mobile phones, we pay the most for its software. So if you replace the mobile phone with a, with a sensor, similar kind of sensor, and program that, perhaps that can also reduce the cost of this equipment. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, it's funny, because um, if you were to buy a CMOS sensor from Sony, if they were willing to just sell you one of their CMOS sensors, um, their color image sensors are far cheaper than their monochrome, um, which is very counterintuitive because there's far more engineering going into the color sensors, right? Um, I think we, we do purchase some of our image sensors from Sony, and I think that we can buy an image sensor standalone for maybe $12, and we have to buy them in bulk. But you're exactly right. You can design a system solely around an image sensor that is mass produced for mobile phones, but it's cheap because of that. And if you design your system around that, yes, that would further drive down the costs. However, there are some very distinct advantages that mobile phone connectivity gives us in terms of um, diagnosis. Um, for instance, creating spatial temporal maps, um, like I said with the mercury, going up and down the coast and being able to store that information in a database, being able to transmit images. Um, for instance, the Giardia cyst counting algorithm that is a very, very complex algorithm. We have to run that on graphical processing units on our server. 
The mobile phone alone is not powerful enough to do that in a timely manner. So it's very vital that we use the application, the software on the phone, to simply transmit that image so that it can be processed and the results sent back to us, speeding up the time to diagnosis um, and providing those applications. But you're exactly right. And we do, we do engineer systems solely around the image sensor. I have one of them up here. And uh, we do have some larger benchtop systems that do use mechanical stages. And we, we don't put a cell phone in there. We just, we just have the image sensor. A question, please. It's not a question, just uh, to thank you for making a cell phone, a smart cell phone useful for something else than uh, social, pro social communication and uh, mailing that lets people play with science using a smartphone. Thank you. And, and to build on that, um, thank you very much for your, your compliment. Um, we are interested also in the educational aspect of this. Um, we have a, a device up here, which I can show you in the next session, that's um, it's very useful for some clinical applications, but actually we take it to high schools and middle schools and elementary schools in the states all the time. And we allow kids to just put their hands all over it and play with it. We have a box of different samples, and it is amazing to see their eyes light up because it's a phone, things they see their parents use every day. And now it's looking at things they had no idea and have never seen before. And that's really amazing to me. OK, hi. I have a question. Uh, I don't know if the, this uh, commercial device maybe has a, a kind of a pre processing algorithms. Uh, for example, when you take a photo, um, my question is um, if you can handle, the, the, for example, the camera of an iPhone, and which is the flexibility that there are open library for that. You, you can acquire the data, the raw data, or, or when, how is the process and how is the, the background of the software and the APIs and the libraries in, in this field? Are you talking specifically about the iPhone? Um, yeah, so that's all of the mobile phones we've made recently use the Nokia Lumia phone, which is a Windows phone. And we, you can use any phone. There's nothing really, uh, the technology is not that much different. There's a higher pixel count on this phone, um, but the iPhone has also a very uh, sophisticated image sensor. However, we cannot take raw images from the Apple software. It's prohibitive. So that's why we use the, uh, the Windows phone, only because we can take raw images. That's really the only reason. Um, Obviously, you can develop apps for Android and Apple Store, all this stuff, and on the Windows phone. But obtaining that raw image is very important to us. I, I, I didn't show this slide, but we have a graph of the sensitivity and accuracy of the GRD accounting device with different file formats, some of which are compressed, some of which the iPhone would only let you access. And the accuracy is far lower than that of dealing with the raw image, as you can imagine, because there's more information. So there are limitations in terms of the, the software and the prohibitive nature of the proprietary technology. Um, and hopefully, there's a future where these devices can be commercialized and, and go through all that and not worry about that. I wanted to ask you um, on the holographic version. So you reconstruct the intensity from the interferogram, no? But you seems not to use that information to reconstruct also the phase delay in the sample? We, you can. You absolutely can, yes. Um, we have phase reconstructions of objects, and sometimes they're very valuable uh, for creating uh, and getting new information about the image. The phase information is encoded there, so you can do a phase reconstruction, absolutely. And uh, one thing I didn't understand on this slide, actually, with base pairs, so which is actually the resolution in terms of uh, KBP? Yes, yes. So let me, let me go to the slide. No, no, you have it already. Oh. Huh. 
Yes, the re resolution is in terms of kilobase pairs, yes. Um, so is around, you said around one KBP? Yes, less than one. 0.33 microns. But uh, that is not uh, below the resolution of the, the microscope? That's not. Of the phone, cell phone microscope? Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure what the resolution of our cell phone microscope is. We would need to do a test with an Air Force target. Um, obviously, the benchtop microscope is somewhere around 200 nanometers. Um, so this being uh, 330 nanometers, it might be on the edge of the resolution of the microscope, yes. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know for sure. So uh, you compare two images, one uh, obtained with the uh, mobile phone and the other one with um, um, the microscope. Have you made uh, the error between the two images? And uh, if yes, uh, how many kilobytes is the difference, or what is the efficiency, the difference between those two images? So are you asking about what the difference in the length measurement is for the microscope versus the mobile what phone? What I am seeing here is target detection. You are trying to see the spot inside the image images and to detect the spots. Uh, if you have made an error between uh, those two images. An error in terms of the length measurement? In terms of images. One is uh, with blur, the other is with, without blur. I'm sorry, I, can you speak up a little bit? I just can't. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, if we consider Commission International de l'Eclairage or um, illumination standards, there is possible to see the error difference between two images. We have two matrix and we right. compute Right, resolution, the yes. Okay, you have two images, one taken by mobile phone and the other with the microscope. Right. So have you made the, have you computed the error between those two images? Right, so that goes back to the previous question. What is our resolution compared to the benchtop microscope? Uh, yes. That, that would be an excellent test to do. We do that often in the lab with an Air Force target with our grading lines, and we see what's the minimum uh, distance between grading lines we can resolve to assess the resolution. I'm sure that was done with this microscope. Uh, it's not my work, so I don't know the number off the top of my head, uh, but it would certainly not be as good as the uh, uh, benchtop microscope. So my guess would be somewhere around uh, I don't know, 300 uh, nanometers, 400 nanometers, something like that. Uh, not necessarily exactly at the diffraction limit uh, because it's not a perfect system. Um, yes. More question, please. More? Let's uh, give thanks again, Professor Zacharis, for the nice presentation. And now uh, we will take advantage that we have 20 minutes in advance. And let's we start at uh, 3.40 with demonstration. We will organize in this way. Five students will come here, ask questions, uh, interact with the professor. Maybe he will show there how to design the, the uh, uh, mobile phone fluorescent microscope. And also I want to say that uh, as we have time today, group number six and these students that were not in the preparatory school and are in group four, uh, one, two, three, we will have today a, a speckle interferometer experiment after a mobile phone demonstration, okay? Group number six and, you know the students that, okay? Let's, we have a 30 minutes break and come back, thank you, okay? Yes, your conference. Yes, uh, Saint to Federica. To Federica. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Because this, depending on how many people. We organize in the best way five students.
Great. Yeah, I have some slides, just 10 I'll go through briefly to just uh, give an overview so people know before they're coming in. Um, and that should take 10 minutes, and then uh, people can line up after that. In any case, you have one, uh, one hour and 30 minutes okay. for demonstration. Great, great. Hi, the, the question, that you had a question about the holography. Yes. I, I wondered whether what he was getting onto was about the, the twin image. Oh, how twin image noise, yeah. yeah. How do you yeah. get rid of the twin? It's, yours is an online hologram. Yeah, it? right, so that, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge problem with holography and line holography. Also taking multi-height. Uh, right, yeah. So the skin is... Uh, 